Merci, Françoise. <coughs> Monsieur le Premier ministre, Mesdames et Messieurs euh, ministres, Mesdames et Messieurs, merci pour votre invitation. Euh, bien que je travaille à New York depuis plus de dix ans, je suis un Canadien très fier. Je suis né à Toronto, je suis de Toronto, et j'ai étudié ici à McGill. Ainsi, le sujet de l'avenir du Canada et de la Québec est très important pour moi. C'est un honneur de partager mon expérience avec, avec vous. À Oliver Wyman, nous avons des bureaux à Toronto et à, ici à, à Montréal, et nous travaillons avec des clients canadiens dans tout le pays. Ce pays et cette province sont notre pays et notre province aussi à Oliver Wyman. Et maintenant, je dois m'excuser de ne pas pouvoir faire ma présentation en français. Comme bloc de Toronto, j'ai déjà utilisé presque tous les mots de français que je connais. Et au sujet de l'innovation numérique, il est préférable que j'utilise la langue dominante d'aujourd'hui, la langue des affaires mondiales, au lieu de français. Jia Wu Hao, Niu Ximen, Jian Shengmen. Non? Je ne dois pas parler chinois tous les tout le journées ici? Okay. Parfait. Um, It's perhaps easiest for me and less embarrassing for me uh, if I continue in English. Uh, I thank you for understanding and your understanding and allowing me to do so, as I'm afraid my French was pretty good back in Peel Pub in 1993. <laughs> But I understand that's closed now and perhaps not the right thing for this subject today. Um, Before I start, this will be a bit of a long talk, and I can't expect you to remember everything that I say. How many people here have seen a TED Talk? So you're familiar with the, the rule of three. People can only remember three things. Um, so today my rule of three will be to remember three rules. The rule of three, the rule of five, and the rule of four. Um, I'll come back to that in a little bit, but um, I couldn't quite keep it to three. First of all, what do we mean by digital innovation? Innovation numérique. This whole forum is based on innovation. It's focused on innovation, and technology will be at the heart of everything that you will be hearing about. But innovation has evolved considerably over the last decades. Historically, innovation that disrupted or created entire industries and millions of jobs was the result of massive government-funded efforts or loose public-private partnership, often without any profit motive. Many of the major breakthroughs that created new industries in the mid to late 20th century in the US were developed in six places. RCA Labs, DARPA, Xerox PARC, Bell Labs, NASA, and IBM. Bell Labs created the laser the C programming language, and the transistor that enabled computers. DARPA created the first internet. Xerox PARC developed Ethernet and the graphical user interface, GUI, that enabled the PC revolution. And have you ever wondered why it would be worth the huge cost to put a man on the moon? NASA spent $25 billion of taxpayer money, which is $137 billion in today's money, on the Apollo program. Well, this program pioneered thousands of technologies that are still used in day-to-day -day life, creating new sectors like water purification, cordless power tools, home insulation, satellite television, freeze-drying food, baby formula, microwave ovens, CAT scans, MRIs, and the list goes on. There are over 6,300 technologies created through the space program that are still in use in daily life today. The Apollo program didn't have a profit motive, but they made enormous technological breakthroughs, which unleashed cycles of applied innovation 
by U.S. companies to commercialize these new technologies, creating entirely new sectors of the economy and millions and millions and millions of jobs. This was how technology innovation often worked. How about today? Well, as recently as 2001, <clears throat> Bell Labs employed 30,000 people. How many do they have today? 1,000. Defense spending is down in relative terms from 10% of GDP in the US in 1960 to 3% today. In 1985, there was a high of nine manned space flights in that year alone. Today, they're down to zero. So what is happening now? This kind of massive, publicly funded, long-term, pure technology innovation is not today's reality. Well, at least in the US and North America, perhaps in China, things are a little bit different. But does that mean there's no innovation in the US anymore? Of course not. So what's happened? Well, this takes us to Pyrex low thermal expansion cookware. Any cooks in the room? <laughs> Come on, it's Quebec. Work with me here. Right, we have some cooks in the room. So you know what one of the biggest breakthroughs of Corning glass was, uh, and, and, and what uh, many of you obviously have in your kitchens. But after casserole bowls, what do you think they developed? Many things, but one of the things they developed is something called Gorilla Glass. Gorilla Glass is a low-cost glass that's scratch-resistant, it's hard, it's light, it's hypersensitive like no glass before it. This glass, along with advancements in light batteries, uh, mobile broadband, interface design, yielded this. A revolution in mobile touch-enabled devices. An entirely new platform for innovation. Today, the App Store has over 1.2 million apps available. But the more important stat here to think about, how many individual app developers have put apps in the App Store? Any guesses? 300,000 individual entrepreneurs and innovators have created apps that are now available to the hundreds of millions of people that have iPhones, iPads, and I'm not even talking about Android and, 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 and that whole ecosystem as well. So there may have only been one Steve Jobs, but there are 300,000 entrepreneurs that are following in his footsteps using the technology that he created. Apple didn't create these apps. Big companies didn't create all of these apps. Many were created by three guys and girls and their dog in a garage. Or as a couple of people here pointed out, in Quebec you don't have garages, you have basements. So, um, but you get the point. Now, let me just pause here. We looked around for some fun pictures. You look at this, kind of funny, right? This is an actual startup in Palo Alto. That startup has just received $8 million in seed funding. And by the way, the meeting to do that probably took place in that garage. So, these companies are not creating new technologies, but rather they're creating new business models enabled by new technology, what we call technology-enabled innovation. Something really, really interesting has happened over the past few years, something that we refer to as the democratization of innovation. This is where many of the big innovative ideas are coming from. Now, I'm not at all underplaying pure science and technology innovation. Far, far from it. We need pure science more than ever. And Quebec has some incredible companies, incredible academic institutions to do just that. But you'll be hearing a lot of that about pure science and technology innovation from others over these three days. You already have, you'll hear more. So I would like to focus this talk specifically on technology-enabled innovation and the democratization of innovation, in addition to the other pure technology topics that you'll hear about. Now, what do I mean? Well, let's consider some of the titans of tech, the titans of the digital world. Google, Facebook, 
Amazon, eBay, Twitter, Netflix, Alibaba, and LinkedIn. What do these eight companies have in common? Did any of them invent a new technology? No. Were any created inside large corporations? No. Were any spun off from big government investment programs? No. They were all started by the proverbial three kids and their dog in a garage or a dorm room. They were startups founded by entrepreneurs and have grown into some of the most valuable and most innovative companies on the planet in the matter of just a few years. Now let me pause for some audience interaction. How much value do you think these eight startups have created? Anyone? A billion? 50 billion? Yeah, 100 billion? One trillion dollars. I now sound like I'm in a Mike Myers movie, I think. Um, some people have seen Austin Powers, great. Um, a trillion dollars. Now, in case you're finding it hard to fathom just how much one trillion is, it's precisely one trillion, one hundred five million, billion, nine hundred and forty-three million and four thousand Canadian. And by the way, that's three times the GDP of all of Quebec. Together, they also employ over a quarter of a million individuals, which is more than Quebec's transportation, forestry, natural resource, and agriculture industries combined. My point is not that they're bigger than Quebec. The point is that this is just eight companies, most of which didn't even exist 10 years ago, and that were created by kids in their dorm rooms. It's not just about new growth and new value. Numerous sectors are seeing their business rules redefined now, not by incumbents, not by traditional competitors, but by startups. If you think about it, who's defining the new retail? It's Amazon. Transportation, Uber. Hotels, Airbnb. How about cable? Well, we have some cable people here today. We've already talked about Netflix. In banking and payments, PayPal and now Square, which by the way was founded by the guy that founded another big startup beforehand. These disruptors were all created by the proverbial three kids and their dog in a garage. So if there's one thing that I'd like you all to take away from this, it's that technology-enabled innovation is not just the newest form of innovation, it's also the most rapid and most disruptive form of innovation ever. The speed at which industries can be disrupted has never been seen before because technology-enabled innovation has very low barriers to entry. A couple of ambitious entrepreneurs, a smart idea, an I.O. software development kit, a bunch of coders, maybe a bit of money to keep the lights on. That's all it takes to get going. And this democratization of innovation means that future in digital innovation will come from entrepreneurs. It will come from startups. It will come from kids in their garages and dorm rooms and basements. The challenge for the, the established companies, many of whom are represented here, is how to harness this creativity. And for Quebec, creating a thriving environment for entrepreneurs and startups to flourish is absolutely essential for the future success of this province. But how? Well, let's take a step back and look at what other places have done to remain relevant in this new era of digital innovation. Let's look at another established market striving to become more of a digital innovation hub. And let's look at New York City. This is a gray New York City day back in 2009. New York City was suffering from the hangover of the financial crisis. Its largest source of employment and tax revenue was in turmoil. And it just lost over 100,000 jobs, $3 billion in tax revenue, and the unemployment rate had passed the 10% mark for the first time in a couple of decades. Not a very pretty situation. At the same time, the media sector, which is the second most important sector after financial services in New York, employing over 300,000 people just in the five boroughs of New York, was also losing ground. Traditional media, magazines, newspapers, advertising, broadcast TV, music, was in a slow dec decline because of digital disruption. And while New York City was the epicenter for these traditional companies, the new digital media darlings, Facebook, Netflix, group on Twitter, Alibaba, were being created elsewhere, in Silicon Valley, but also in Tel Aviv, Shanghai, Helsinki, Hyderabad, 
many other places that has embraced the entrepreneurial mentality and were hotbeds of startups and innovations. So Mayor Bloomberg realized that New York City needed to understand these changes in the media sector because of its importance and how rapidly things were changing. In February 2009, he initiated a multi-year effort called Media NYC 2020, whose aim was to identify and address the challenges and opportunities facing New York's media sector in order to secure its place as an industry leader also in new media. Oliver Wyman was fortunate enough to be selected as New York City's knowledge partner for this effort that spanned the last four years of Bloomberg's tenure. So how do you attract companies to your city? Well, many would say it's easy, tax credits. As the video game entrepreneurs and executives here told us, Quebec has used that carrot before. I'll share with you though an interesting anecdote. At the first CEO roundtable at Gracie Mansion with Mayor Bloomberg, that's the mayor's official residence in New York, although as a side note, he's the first mayor since it was uh, put to the city in 1942 not to live there because his own place was nicer, so he, he just used that for meetings. Um, true story. Uh, but the discussion we were having there, media CEOs, uh, the immediate response was, hey, great, Mike, give us some tax breaks, give us some tax credits, we'll bring some more jobs here. The mayor's response was classic. He said, friends, I'm a businessman. I started a small company. I'm worth $36 billion. I know a bit about business. The easiest way to drive volume is you drop your price. It's also the very last thing that you want to have to do. New York City is a premium product. It has a premium price. I'm not gonna drop the price here. What I am gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that it remains a premium product and that people know it's a premium product and are willing, therefore, to pay for the premium product. It may seem to be more expensive on the surface, but ultimately, it's much more economical to start a business here. Interesting words to think about. So if not tax breaks alone, what was the answer? Well, Bloomberg and his administration didn't know. Neither did Oliver Wyman. The intention was to get the leaders and smart minds in the city, large established companies, startup founders, venture capitalists, academics, working together to figure this out. So Media NYC 2020 recruited an advisory group of over 70 CEOs to dedicate their time and energy to this effort. When Mike Bloomberg's calls, people pick up the phone. And when he says he wants you there, you show up. This group, advisor group of 70 CEOs, was chaired by Jeff Bukas, CEO and chairman of Time Warner, Sir Martin Sorrell, the CEO of WPP, Tim Armstrong, who was initially the head of Americas for Google and then became the CEO of AOL, and Peter Price, the head of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences and what I like to call a walking Rolodex. But this showed very clearly this is a serious effort and people like this were committing over a long period of time to putting their name and, and their reputation at risk to say we are co-chairing this so it better result in something. Um, there were over 20 executive events and workshops held in New York City and around the world, personally hosted by advisory group members. The CEOs of Thomson Reuters, the New York Times, Hearst, Condé Nast, the Metropolitan Museum, Barclays Capital in New York City, WPP hosted an event in London, and Publicis hosted an event in Paris. Even Oliver Wyman hosted an event in San Francisco. These workshops were attended by the CEOs and only the CEOs. No substitutions were allowed. That way, everyone understood the importance of this effort and that their time would be well spent. And people with real influence to make change were actually there talking about what change had to be made. Overall, we interacted with another 400 industry experts and thought leaders through interviews, workshops, roundtables, many of whom were contributed by the CEO advisory group in terms of their top thinkers in digital, in strategy, in innovation. The kickoff for Media NYC 2020 was held at Gracie Mansion. So here is the mayor's official residence, but um, I won't show you his actual townhouse on uh, the Upper East Side. Um, 
But interesting, in this initial discussion, apart from the tax break and tax credit uh, discussion, several dozen CEOs of traditional and new media companies alike had differing opinions on many, many things. But on one, there was unanimous agreement. Digital innovation will not come from the big companies. It will come from the kids in their garages. It quickly became evident to this group of leaders that success was not about improving the lot of those big companies. It was about making sure that the ecosystem was there for, for startups. So, who cares what New York City did? We all know that Toronto keeps looking at New York and comparing itself to New York. I've always loved how Quebec and Montreal is very happy being an incredible city and not having to compare itself to someone. So why should you care? Well, it's been over four years since the effort was initiated. So let's look at how New York City changed. Between 2008 and 2012, Tech employment in New York City grew by 30% compared to 2% across the US. Media employment growth over the same period was 6% in New York City and minus three uh, in the rest of the United States, or in the United States overall. Over this period, New York City overtook Boston, long an innovation hub, to become number two in venture capital deal count. And there was a dramatic growth in deal volume compared to Boston and even San Francisco. Now, no one was trying to say we need to beat San Francisco. It's a very unique place. But if you have almost 50% year-on-year venture capital deal volume happening, there's obviously some momentum going on there when Boston and San Francisco even are both stagnant in the same period of time. New York City's rating or ranking on the Global Innovation Index, which ranks all cities worldwide for, for innovation on a number of, 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 of uh, characteristics, went from eighth in 2009 to fourth in 2011 to tied first in 2013. But one of the most important measures of success is perception. I'll tell you a little story, a little funny anecdote. Chris Hughes. It was Mark Zuckerberg's Harvard roommate and, and one of the Facebook co-founders. Uh, he was the one who didn't go out to California but then helped Obama get elected in 2008 by running his digital campaign, which itself was one of the most innovative political innovations using digital ever seen. Um, he told us a story of sitting in their Harvard dorm room in 2004. That's only 10 years ago. Wondering what to do next. I don't know, let, let's, let's go out to San Francisco. Someone there will tell us what to do. Even though Mark was from Long Island and Chris always wanted to move to New York, they didn't even consider it as a place to scale their business at that time. Though there may have been some startup activity happening there, it was drowned out by Wall Street, Madison Avenue, Fashion District, and so on. It just wasn't known, it wasn't relevant. However, now, this perception seems to be changing. Nicknaming it Silicon Alley, many international media outlets have started taking note. These are actual articles from international press. Could New York be a better US base for European startups than the Valley? Question mark. Craving talent, Israelis flock to Silicon Alley. Five reasons why foreign startups should set their bases in New York City. New York is now firmly on the map as a fertile place for entrepreneurs and talent. And many successful entrepreneurs, and indeed entire companies, are now moving back to New York, including the aforementioned Chris Hughes, who, by the way, is worth $860 million with the Facebook stock he still had. And he's putting that to use in New York City. So can Quebec learn something from this? I think we probably can. This is the first rule I'd like you to remember from today, the rule of three. This is about jobs, this is about investment, and this is about buzz. So we'll come back to some of the specific initiatives that played a role in New York City. But now, let's look at how Quebec is doing on technology-enabled innovation and the startup ecosystem. On the city level, Montreal was ranked 31st in the Global Innovation Index in 2009, but slipped to 36th in 2000 and 13. 
However, at the end of the day, what really matters is not an academic index, but rather where entrepreneurs want to go. Montreal has the second largest student population in North America. Only Boston has more. There are many large universities here and elsewhere in the province, fantastic universities. Do people here want to be entrepreneurs? And if so, do they want to be entrepreneurs here? To prepare for this forum, we contacted 1,671 students, to be precise, and recent graduates in 15 cities across North America, including Montreal and, and Quebec City. What we found was quite startling. Young Quebecers are just as eager to join a startup as any other. Actually, just stop and look at these figures. It's amazing just how many young people are thinking about startups everywhere. This would definitely not have looked this way even five years ago. A study by the IEQ showed that 34% of 18 to 35 year olds in Quebec say they intend to start a company at some point. This is compared to 25% in 2013. More and more kids are looking to be entrepreneurs, they're looking to start a startup, they're looking to join a startup. It's not all about being an eye banker or, unfortunately, a consultant these days. That is startling, but it's very encouraging. But when we look at where young people consider going to join or create a startup, more than five times as many Canadians look to the US as the place they want to go to start or join uh, an entrepreneurial business than the other way around. A great many Quebecers look to New York City, San Francisco, Boston. The balance of trade issue in talent that I know Suzanne is, uh, feels very passionately about is not getting better. In fact, it's likely getting worse. This is a problem. Now, what makes one place more attractive than another? We found in our work in New York City and our extensive discussions with entrepreneurs, financiers, and executives here in Quebec, that there is no one simple answer. I'm, I'm very sorry, Monsieur le Premier Ministre, that we don't have the answer on a slide here for you, unfortunately. <laughs> Rather, there needs to be an ecosystem of multiple elements that work together to create a virtuous circle of support for innovation and entrepreneurship. This ecosystem is what attracts encourages and retains startups, creating the buzz that this is the place to bring good ideas to fruition. This is what makes places like Silicon Valley and now New York City hubs of digital innovation. If government funding were enough, Dubai and Abu Dhabi would be tied for first in the innovation index, and they're not. Tax breaks alone aren't the answer. Silicon Valley and New York City are both expensive places to start a business on the surface but ultimately are better and cheaper places to start a business because all the components of the ecosystem are strong. So what are the components of a successful ecosystem and do we have them here? Well, here's our second rule for the afternoon for you to remember and I will summarize at the end and there will be no quiz. The rule of five. We've identified five critical components for creating a startup ecosystem. A desirable place to live an entrepreneurial culture, and successful role models. Availability of engineering talent, access to capital, but smart capital, and early customers and partners. And by the way, I apologize, I should have said this before. We have summary notes that we are very happy to mail out to people in English and French uh, of what I've been talking about. So uh, if you don't want to take notes and you'd rather wait for those, we will be distributing those next week to anyone and everyone who is interested. So let's think about a desirable place to live. First and foremost, is this a city or a place that people want to stay in or move to? If it isn't somewhere young people will be excited to live in, the rest of the appeal is completely irrelevant. For New York City, this was a clear strength to play to. It offers an extremely attractive and diverse quality of life. It has low crime, exceptional diversity, home to 700 performing arts companies, 200 museums. It has something for everyone. Many people and many entrepreneurs 
want to live here much more than in Palo Alto. That's definitely something to play up. How about Quebec? Well, both Montreal and Quebec City are known as vibrant cities, multilingual, multicultural, with an enviable quality of life. Really the only place to really find a piece of Europe in North America. That's one of the reasons so many students want to come here to study, myself included. However, we have heard from some of the leaders we've spoken with here in Quebec that the French fluency requirement may be a challenge for some, especially those who may have great ideas and ambition, love speaking the French language, French Canadian culture, be very good at conversational French, want to get better, but don't have the time to bring their French quite to the official standards required. Many people may really want to stay here as part of the French culture, but can't. By the way, the immigration challenges in the US were a real pet peeve for Mayor Bloomberg. So this is an issue in a lot of places. He was frustrated that the US would happily take money from foreign students and give them what is amongst the best education in the world, going to Stanford, MIT, or, or the McGill of the South in Boston. What's it called? Harvard, right? Um, but then he says, then we kick them out. As soon as we've trained them and given them the best education possible, we kick them out and send them back home with their newly learned skills to India or France or Brazil. He saw it as an acute hindrance to the competitiveness of the US and thus of New York City. Now, I'm not sure if Canadian immigration policy is any better. I, I'm not an expert there at all. But think about it. If Quebec can be a place that talented people from all over the world want to come to and are able to and want to stay, it could be a huge competitive advantage. Entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial culture. Is there a culture of risk taking? of creativity? Are there visible success stories to encourage and nurture, nurture uh, future entrepreneurs? The best motivation for the next generation of entrepreneurs is to see success stories of other entrepreneurs. Silicon Valley has, a lo has long had a network of role models and success stories from Larry Page and Mark Zuckerberg to Jerry Wang and Jack Dorsey. There are hundreds of success stories that encourage more people to give it a shot. These four people are worth $70 billion between them. That's motivation for a lot of people to say, maybe it's worth the risk to try something new because they did it. And there are hundreds of examples there. How about New York City? Well, in New York City, let's start with the mayor. The mayor himself was an entrepreneur. People forget that he started a small company that's now worth about $40 billion. And as he constantly reminded people over and over and over again, he started it in New York City. Over time, New York City has slowly built up a cadre of success stories too. People like Kevin Ryan, who founded DoubleClick, sold it for three billion, and has founded a whole bunch of other companies since, including Guilt Group, which has now valued itself at over a billion. Tim Armstrong, who was one of the anchors of the growth of Google and now is turning around AOL, did very well out of the, the Google experience, of course. He's in New York. And Chris Hughes, we mentioned not just Facebook, but actually someone who's using digital innovation to create massive social change by helping elect uh, the first uh, uh, black president in, in the history of the country. Most importantly, as these people will tell you, in the US, it's OK to fail. They've all failed at some point. You get up. And you try again. In fact, many US VCs we've spoken with are suspicious if you haven't trialed and failed yet because they say, how can you learn if you haven't made any mistakes yet? And I don't want to be the one that you make your first mistake with. That's the culture of entrepreneurship. Now, as many leaders we've spoken with here have pointed out, and of course we all know if we spent any time in this province, Quebec itself has a legacy of entrepreneurs. Guy La Liberté, Jean Couture, Serge Gordin, André Chagnon. Huge businesses have been created here from scratch. Maybe in a basement, not in a garage, but still. And indeed, they have motivated and enabled others to set up around them and, and take some risks as well. But as we saw previously, many of the younger generation who might start digital businesses and are very mobile are looking south of the border. 
We heard from several of the entrepreneurs with whom we spoke here in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada that Canadians also are inherently more risk averse than Americans as a culture. Here, if you try business and fail, it's not looked upon very favorably. And if you come home and tell your parents that you're leaving your job as a lawyer to go build an app, they will probably not be too pleased about it. But that's an issue. Part of the reason is also that there aren't many digital innovation success stories to emulate, at least not very visible ones. The virtuous circle hasn't really got going yet. But let me plant another thought with you, and I'll look to my left to Suzanne here. How many Canadians, how many Quebecers are success stories south of the border? The co-founder of suppliermarket.com, which was sold for $1.2 billion, is a McGill grad. The CFO of Google is a Montreal native and a graduate of l'Université de Québec à Montréal. There are countless more. But let me ask you this. The founder of suppliermarket.com is often asked to come back to speak at HBS, at Harvard Business School, where he also went. In fact, he started the business there in his dorm room. How many times has he been asked to come back to McGill? Zero. I think that that will change now that Suzanne's running things. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll give you his email address. <laughs> but this is really quite striking. A professor at MIT did a study of the revenue of companies that were founded by living Stanford and MIT alumni. At Stanford, living alumni have founded companies that employ 5.4 million people and have $2.7 trillion in annual revenue. At MIT, living graduates have founded companies that, have, that employ 5 million people and have annual revenues of $2 trillion. I'm going to get in trouble for this. But what is the answer to that question? in Quebec. I put McGill there just because I can put uh, Suzanne on the spot, but I think it's the same for all the universities here. I think it could be quite an impressive number. And we're talking about alumni, not necessarily that they did that here, they may have done that who knows where in the world. But if you think about the diaspora, the Quebec diaspora, people that are from Quebec, people that have studied in Quebec, if it's the second biggest student population in North America, those people are going somewhere. They still love the city, they still love the province. That's why I'm back here. How can that diaspora be tapped into? Could they help prime the pump to start this virtual circle of entrepreneurs, sorry, virtuous circle of entrepreneur success stories here? Now, I'll be very provocative here, not that I'm a tax expert at all, but tax incentives and tax breaks, you know, perhaps there might be tax incentives to get a few of these billionaires to move back and become the funders and the, 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 the mentors for the next generation of startups. Can you imagine if you could bring some of these prodigal sons and daughters back and have them turbocharge and, and, and get going this, this virtuous uh, circle of entrepreneurship because then there are success stories around. And they've come back because all the other elements are so attractive. Now, I'll move on. Availability of engineering talent. Even great ideas need coders and software engineers to bring them to life. A talent pool that consists of high quality engineering talent is essential. For New York City, lack of engineering talent was a huge issue as NYU and Columbia are simply not comparable with MIT or Stanford in terms of engineering pedigree or volume. However, New York has had the opposite balance of trade issue of students that Montreal and Quebec have. Many students from top schools elsewhere moved to New York City to seek opportunities. However, the availability of sufficient top engineering talent still remained one of the biggest issues raised by the CEOs and startup entrepreneurs and venture capitalists in Media NYC 2020. I'll show you shortly a big move that New York City did to address that in a few minutes. Quebec has, I think, more than 16 engineering programs at its universities. I'm not even counting the community colleges and, and other uh, institutes of higher learning. Many are world class. As we've mentioned, Montreal is the second largest student population in North America. That's amazing. Quebec's issue doesn't seem to be developing engineering talent, but rather retaining it. According to the Center for Interuniversity Research and Analysis here in Montreal, statistically of all professions, 
engineers are the most likely to leave Canada. While the province attracts and trains students very, very well, many of them leave. And that has to change. There's actually a lot of money around. And capital will flow to where good ideas are. But it isn't just money that startups need. It is smart money from people who themselves have been successful and can provide guidance, challenge, mentorship, access to the people and resources that are required for success, patience, and understanding of the life stages of startups. New York City wasn't near the maturity of Silicon Valley or even Boston 10 years ago. But once a couple of waves of startup successes had happened, these past successes enabled future successes. Starting with DoubleClick, which was sold for $3 billion in 2007, there have been successful exits that have encouraged venture, capitals, venture capitalists to launch successive funds, reinvesting profits in the next generation of ideas. Successful CEOs become the investors for the next round of startups. Previous VPs become the next founders and CEOs, and so on. Success begets success, and no place is that more true than in investments. And the next wave is already there with an estimated value of $10 billion, not yet with an exit or an IPO, but very highly valued because of the support they've got, in many cases, from investors who did very well with these previous waves. So you can see the idea of the virtuous circle in many elements here. Now, Montreal doesn't yet have the same access to venture capital uh, that other centers do. Uh, what Jacques Bernier is, is doing with Terrorless is a fantastic start. But I think Jacques will agree that the true virtuous circle we mentioned above is not yet in place, needs to get moving a bit. Canadians are very, very comfortable making risky investments in mining or oil exploration. We've been doing it for decades, and we're good at it. One or two big hits out of 20 will make or break a company, even if all the rest fail. This is the same for digital startups. But this space is not one that most Canadian banks and investors are familiar with. The focus is more on concrete financials, revenues, quarterly results. But this is not how startups work. Think about this. When Facebook received $500 million in venture funding, it still had never made any money. And Snapchat received a $3 billion takeover offer from Facebook before they had any profits, actually before they had any revenues, actually before they had even thought about how to make revenue. One of the successful entrepreneurs we spoke with in Montreal pointed out an interesting anecdote. In the US, VC investors want to be close to their investments. They want to spend time with management. They want to have lunch with them every week. They want to provide guidance from their own experience. They want to see how things are going. He then asked me how many times he'd been invited to lunch by his Canadian VC investors when he was starting out. What do you think his answer was? Zero. There needs to be a closer connection and familiarity in investing as well. Now finally, as we have said, technology-enabled innovation can happen anywhere. However, startups need access to customers, content, distribution, knowledge of the sectors they want to serve or they want to disrupt, early customers to give them credibility for further customers. Why has New York City become an attractive place to start a business? One reason is because it's a center of finance, so it's the hub of fintech. It's the center of fashion and spawned Gilt Group, Rent the Runway, and many others. It's the center of advertising, of media, of the arts, of medical research. Proximity to established sectors is very, very valuable. They have the assets that startups need and the talent that they can use. If you want to start an online news business, like Huffington Post, for example, it helps to be down the road from the New York Times where you might be able to hire some people and find talent that will know how to create a new digital business that serves similar uh, uh, customers. And this close proximity is valuable to the established players too as a source for innovation. There is, however, an issue that we call the velvet rope syndrome. 
anyone gone to nightclubs and you see the velvet rope and you have to wait there and you can't go in, but then Paris Hilton comes up and she's whisked in and so on, right? That's kind of what we mean. In Palo Alto, you can literally be in a Starbucks line with Eric Schmidt from Google or Marissa Meyer from Yahoo or the senior principals of, of, of VCs from Sand Hill uh, Road. They might look at you and say, oh, is that a business plan? Hey, let me buy you a latte. Tell me a little bit about your business plan. That seriously happens out there. It's part of the culture. In New York, there is unparalleled proximity as we're showing here. But the established CEOs are generally having breakfast at Michael's on 53rd Street, while the startups are down in Chelsea or in Brooklyn or Williamsburg. Now, this has started to change. At one of the CEO roundtables in New York City, the chairman and CEO of one of the world's largest media conglomerates was sitting next to a 26-year-old founder and CEO of a successful startup, which has since been bought by Facebook. As this young entrepreneur was explaining his perspectives on how education needed to change to keep the US competitive with India and China and teach different programming languages to kids and not just reading and writing and so on, this titan of the media industry next to him sat with his jaw open, literally open. When the young chap had finished, this big uh, media CEO said, well, I didn't understand 90% of what you were saying but I do understand now that I need to spend a lot more time with people like you. <laughs> you can probably guess which company I'm talking about if you know anything about the CEOs. But anyway, that needs to happen, and that needs to happen more. So how about Quebec? Well, if you think about it, Quebec has an incredible corporate foundation to leverage. How many cities in the world can say that they have a major airframe manufacturer. I think only four, depending on how you count Airbus. You probably need to count every capital in Europe to do that. But um, Montreal's one of them with Bombardier. You add Air Canada, Via Rail, CN Rail, CAE, Pratt & Whitney, Lockheed Martin, Aeroplan, EMEA. I think the headquarters of IATA is even in Montreal. I couldn't think of a better place for a startup to figure out how to transform some part of the transportation industry. But Uber wasn't created here, it was created somewhere else. Think about energy. Hydro-Quebec is the world's top producer of hydropower and knows a thing or two about power grids, exporting power, trading power, and so on. Probably a pretty exciting place for someone to think about a real innovation in energy. Anyone heard of Nest? Nest is really transforming energy usage just bought by Google for a couple billion, that also was founded out west. Why isn't that being founded here? Because you've got access to people who know more than anyone about electricity. Agriculture, enterprise technology with CGI, neuroscience, optics and pho photonics at Eno in, in, in Quebec City, the list goes on. But here's a provocative question. How much time do the CEOs of these leading companies spend with startups, with entrepreneurs, with students, with kids in garages. Now let me ask the CEOs in the room, I think we probably have some here. Would you take a meeting with these strange looking kids? <laughs> if they came knocking on your door, would, they, would you take a meeting with these guys? I don't know, I, I think if you asked this 10, 15 years ago, you probably would have said, and uh, yeah, you know, why don't you talk to my under assistant director of PR or something like that. Well, how about now? Would you take a meeting with them now when they started a company that's worth $400 billion? Question is, would they take a meeting with you? <laughs> now that's a little bit provocative bit of a joke, but actually it's not that far from the truth because the point is you don't know who the next ones are because you know what, nine out of 10 are probably gonna fail. It's easy to look now and say, oh, I would have taken that meeting for sure, but how about the other nine who didn't make it this far? And that's something that has to change, but something that could be extremely powerful here. So we've heard from senior executives here in Quebec over the past weeks that they admit that there isn't much interaction between established players and startups. They traditionally are in two different worlds. But this will be crucial. We heard from some of the folks at CGI, they started to see startups as potential partners. 
combining their creativity with their access to customers, but admit there's still a long ways to go. But imagine if Quebec could be a place where its senior executives were the most approachable in the world, where entrepreneurs could kick around their ideas with them, where innovation was welcomed as a collaborative affair between industry leaders with all the assets and the entrepreneurs with all the ideas and agility and creativity. That would be quite something. Connections and familiarity are absolutely crucial for a digital innovation ecosystem. So if all of these five elements of the ecosystem are established, a city or region becomes a more fertile and supportive place for startups. Informal networks develop, successes happen, more ideas are spawned, people are attracted to the region, the virtuous circle starts spinning. Quebec has great talent. It is a great place to live. There are fantastic industry partners and early customers for startups. From the initial discussions that we've had, the issues in the ecosystem seem to be culture and entrepreneurial culture, role models and visible success stories, funding, and connectivity between the establishment and the startup community. The virtuous circle hasn't really started to spin just yet, except in some very targeted areas such as perhaps gaming. And even there, the common view from many in the gaming se sector itself is that if the tax incentives go away, so might many of the jobs. Now let's return to New York City. The mayor and his administration didn't introduce sweeping tax incentives. They didn't provide massive government funding. What they did was act as conveners, bringing together the top minds and senior leaders from across the industry to think about the issues, start an ongoing dialogue across sectors and between startups and established players, and then devise select initiatives to get the virtuous circle to spin. Now this is important. There were no preconceived ideas for what the solution should entail. Rather, the key stakeholders developed these ideas together through many workshops, discussions, and consultations. It was the CEOs, successful entrepreneurs, investors, along with government players and the academic sector that came up with four strategic focus areas for New York City and 11 initiatives that were subsequently launched to help develop and enhance the ecosystem. Those four focus areas were Connectivity, connecting people to one another and fostering cross-industry collaboration. Innovation, developing a world-class hub for innovation, providing resources for, star for startups and connecting them to sources of funding. Not giving them funding, connecting them to sources of funding. Talent and education, recruiting homegrown technical talent, relaxing visas for international talent expanding creative and technical programs at universities, and retooling the skills of current employees in the traditional media sectors that were being displaced. And lastly, turning New York City into a bilateral media gateway as an entry point for foreign companies and a staging ground for US companies reaching out to the world. To support these focus areas, the advisor group approved a targeted list of initiatives that were launched by the New York City Economic Development Corporation, but in close partnership with the private sector in each case. These programs are all still running. Now, I'm not gonna go through them all, although there is a report. You can see a lot more information on what each of these is, but I'll highlight three of them as examples of what kinds of things the advisor group agreed could help get the virtuous circle to spin faster. Now, firstly, there are over 100 institutions of higher learning in New York City of various sizes. Lots of great research going on. Not just technology research, but also research into business models, consumer behavior, product design, branding. But how are they connected to the companies and entrepreneurs who could commercialize these innovations? So the NYC Media Lab was established as a joint venture between Columbia University and NYU Poly. It's the engineering school of New York University. To cultivate collaboration between the city's startups, established companies, and its academic institutions. These stakeholders ca came together to answer questions that are relevant to business. How mobile technologies impact pedestrian safety. 
how to project future internet bandwidth trends. And the best news is, it only cost the city about a million dollars to get this on its feet. Now the private sector has assumed the funding role with 10 leading corporations as founding members. And when you look to see who those leading corporations are, it also creates some buzz that, wow, there are some big players getting personally involved and investing their own money to keep this going. It's not a government initiative anymore. Another low-cost, high-impact initiative. Some of the startup founders and CEOs involved in Media NYC 2020 made an insightful observation. Startups need data. New York City has data, but doesn't know what to do with it. Huge amounts of data. Data on parking tickets, subway delays, population statistics, health code violations, even the type and numbers of trees in Central Park. That's true. Why not provide it to the startup community and let their creativity loose? So the NYC Big Apps competition was initiated to provide software developers with access to the huge number of city data sets to do what they want with it in a competitive environment. The first competition had more than 20 teams competing with a judging panel of executives, successful entrepreneurs, and champions of innovation. The FINA Gala Awards Ceremony was hosted at Barry Diller's IAC headquarters, one of New York City's iconic buildings, and itself home to a $3 billion group of successful startups, <clears throat> such as Match.com and Urban Spoon. <clears throat> the broad, excuse me. <clears throat> Need some wine. <clears throat> maybe, <clears throat> maybe a stiff sc scotch. Um, but the prizes were presented personally by Mayor Bloomberg, who's a celebrity in his own right. And leading VCs wandered around to chat with all the guests and, uh, and teams. The first year, the grand prize went to a group of, start, of smart kids from India called My City Way, who not only received a nice check as their prize, but immediately received funding from a local venture capital firm. But listen to this. The next day, the picture of the winning team shaking Bloomberg's hand was on the front page of the Times of India, which gave the New York City startup scene a great deal of PR. To indicate how randomly and beautifully the virtuous circle works, shortly thereafter, BMW was just setting up its iVentures fund. Their first investment, My City Way. And at the second annual New York City Big Apps competition, a BMW board member attended to present the prizes together with Mayor Bloomberg and to announce <clears throat> that their $100 million VC fund will be set up in New York City, not in Palo Alto. <clears throat> now in its fourth iteration, it's grown to become a series of six curated events over four months that guides teams from idea to design to build to debut, access to over 1,000 data sets, 27 development devices and platforms, access to 50 mentors with over 100 teams competing for $100,000 in cash prizes and exposure to VCs and customers. And the great news here, this doesn't really cost much money either. IAC is happy to host the gala prize ceremony and it's quite a fun event. The VCs and other execs donate their time <clears throat> Prizes are funded by 17 sponsors, such as Facebook, eBay, and Amazon. And opening up the city's data sets costs virtually nothing, but is worth a huge amount. Now, there were also some bigger moves. <clears throat> you recall the issue raised by many advisors about the lack of engineering talent. To address this issue, both real and perceived, New York City requested proposals from universities around the world to build a top tier post-secondary engineering and applying, applied sciences campus in New York City. 17 institutions from around the world responded. Even Stanford <clears throat> was amongst those bidding. <clears throat> and in 2011, New York City signed a partnership with Cornell University and Technion Israel Institute of Technology 
to build a new $2 billion campus on 11 acres of New York City's Roosevelt Island, owned by the city. Ultimately, this will more than double the existing number of full-time graduate engineering students and faculty in New York City. But perhaps more importantly, this doesn't itself have to produce all the engineers the city needs. But it clearly signals to the academic community, international community, student startup community, that New York City is serious about being a world-class engineering and applied technology center. In New York City, these initiatives help tee up different parts of the startup ecosystem. The Big Apps competition created buzz amongst entrepreneurs, links to VC, and helped New York City's visibility internationally. Media Lab connected the academic community, the private sector, and the startup community. The Engineering and Applied Science campus addresses talent needs both directly and indirectly through buzz and reputation. However, it is very important to recognize that none of these initiatives themselves, or indeed the entire list, directly resulted in the success in New York City that we showed you before. What these initiatives did was to put some sparks, <clears throat> some sparks out there, created buzz and the perception of New York City as an exciting place for startups, and create the connections for people to come up with their own initiatives on their own. As the virtuous circle started to spin faster, more money came in, more engineers and entrepreneurs moved to New York, more connections were built, more success stories were visible in the media. There is no blueprint of which initiatives to launch. However, we feel that there is a blueprint for how to approach the question, and perhaps one that Quebec could learn from. And here's our rule of four. There was a burning platform, a large group of senior leaders, a convener, and clear focus and ambition. That was the burning platform at the time in New York City. Something had to be done, and people understood the importance of it. There was a large group of senior leaders. These 70 CEOs, university presidents, VC managing partners, successful startup founders, and so on, were personally involved in the roundtables. No one was allowed to send a substitute. They hosted sessions at their headquarters. They provided access to their innovative thinkers in their organizations. And they were passionate about the success of New York City. This has to start at the top with those who can actually get stuff done. But how do you get those people to commit that kind of time? Well, what would you do if he called you up? <laughs> the convener here was not the mayor of New York. The convener here was Michael Bloomberg. And when Mike calls CEO answers, when Mike says, this is important to me personally, so now it's important to you too. He was an entrepreneur himself, and he wanted part of his legacy to be a thriving entrepreneurial city and a sustainable startup ecosystem. You really need an individual to put a personal face on this and personal commitment to secure the involvement of the influencers. And lastly, there was a clear area of focus, ambition, and an understanding that this takes time. New York City was never trying to compete in pure technology. Media was the initial area of focus given the economic footprint of that sector. New York City decided that success for itself would be to be the number one global leader for traditional and new media by 2020. The objectives and metrics were clear, as we said at the outset, jobs, investment, buzz. There was understanding that this takes time, as the name Media NYC 2020 implies, or at least it did in 2009, a multi-year effort that needs patience and commitment. The results that I showed earlier took four years. The danger is that most such efforts fizzle out after a couple of months. What does this mean for Quebec? Well, no one can say what the right solution for Quebec is. What initiatives are needed? What sectors have the most chance of success? But the leaders in this room, the leaders across the province can. A blueprint for how to approach this could follow our rule of four. What's the burning platform? 
Well, there may not be a recession or massive job losses, but defining why it is essential to address this now will greatly help rally leaders together. Perhaps Quebec's declining rank on the Innovation Index is one indication. Perhaps the data we showed on students and recent graduates' perceptions of both entrepreneurship overall and Quebec's relative attractiveness and the, 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 the balance of trade away from Quebec is another. But that's a good question to, uh, to think about. Why is this essential now and how can people rally behind it? Who are the CEOs and other leaders who will personally take on this challenge? collaborate with each other, and determine what actions Quebec should take. Success requires committed leaders with passion to create a true ecosystem for Quebec and the resources and the influence to do it. The government, corporations, startups, academics, investors need to figure out the problem together. They will devise the solutions to make Quebec a hub of digital innovation and have the influence and the resources to then make it happen. And who is the convener who can get these people to work together? This can't just be another effort that will fizzle out. <clears throat> it needs someone who can secure the involvement of these influential leaders across the province and impress upon them the importance of this as a top priority. Monsieur le Premier Ministre, I, I think this largely begins with you. And of course, what you're starting here last year and this year is an indication of how, how uh, important innovation is for you personally. I would assume that if something were a personal priority for you, and you made that a personal priority for the business, academic, financial leaders across the province, they would take that seriously. <clears throat> and a small group of influential leaders, co-chairs of the advisor group, could personally drive this on your behalf. What is the area of focus and ambition? Well, looking carefully at the strengths and issues of the region, it's important to define where success can be achieved. Technology-enabled innovation, the democratization of innovation is relevant across many sectors. <clears throat> Quebec needs to define what role it wants to play. Is it best suited as a hub for innovation and transportation, agriculture, energy, information technology, even e-education, given the depth, the depth of video game talent here and an understanding about how to appeal to children and, and, and the youth, e-education could be an interesting area that one might not think about immediately. How about e-government? Should it focus on one, on two, on three sectors? And what is the end game that should be achieved? What does the group want Quebec to become? And what timeline will stakeholders commit to? The initiative will take time and effort, but then it will also produce tangible results. <clears throat> so I'll return to what I said at the beginning, three, five, four. The rule of three, this is about creating jobs, investment, and buzz. The rule of five, to create the startup ecosystem, you need to provide a desirable place to live, ensure an entrepreneurial culture with successful role models, the availability of engineering talent, access to capital and smart money, and early customers, partners, and strategic buyers. And the rule of four, to jumpstart this ecosystem, this virtuous circle, there is no set answer. You need to define the burning platform, engage a large group of senior, passionate leaders. You need a convener to make this a top priority. And you need a clear area of focus and ambition for what will be a multi-year effort. Monsieur le Premier Ministre, Mesdames et Messieurs les Ministres, Mesdames et Messieurs, j'espère que l'expérience de New York peut être pertinente s'appliquer à votre situation et vos aspirations. Comme vous avez vu, il est possible de changer la réputation d'une ville ou d'une région à travers un effort, un effort collaboratif et soutenu. J'espère qu'en 2020, nous verrons tous des nouvelles comme celle-ci. <coughs> 